You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, Episode 31, Sonnet 30. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say, I say I'm not, not just another one of your place? Your place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? We all know William Shakespeare from his plays, but relatively few people know much about his sonnets, which is sad because it was the only writing that he ever published, and its contents form the backbone for the rest of his magnificent body of work. If you're just listening into this podcast for the first time, welcome. While you could start this podcast at any episode, I do recommend checking out episode one just to get up to speed on the background and the framing. Hitting Sonnet 30 feels like a milestone worthy of celebrating. My apologies to any of my listeners who found the volume levels of the previous episodes inconsistent. I hope I've managed to correct the recording levels. Regarding the book publishing, I've been trying to arrange an ISBN, but it's taking a lot longer than I expected. I've learned a bit about formatting in the meanwhile, and the digital and print copies are both looking great. To my patrons, I could never fully express my gratitude for your generous support and for showing faith in a project that I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. You play a crucial role in making this work, so thank you, thank you, and thank you again. Sonnet 30 Sonnet 30 positions the reader as a victim pleading his case in a court of law. Line 2's Remembrance of Things Past is a reference to chapter 11 of the Book of Wisdom, which states, Whether they were absent or present, their punishment was alike, for their grief was double with mourning and the remembrance of things past. For when they perceived that through their torments good came unto them, they felt the Lord. This presents a pretty good thematic summary of Sonnet 29, which is as follows. When to the sessions of sweet silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past, I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought, and with old woes new wail my dear time's waste. Then can I drown an eye unused to flow, for precious friends hid in death's dateless night and weep afresh love's long since cancelled woe, and moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Then can I grieve at grievances foregone, and heavily from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of forebemoaned moan, which I knew pay as if not paid before. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored, and sorrows end. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 30. When to the sessions of sweet silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past, I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought, and with old woes new wail my dear time's waste. As in the previous sonnet, and a few earlier ones, Sonnet 30's first word, when, begins with a double V as opposed to a W, which I suspect indicates the separation of the bard into his physical and sonnet forms. Sessions appears only once in the sonnet sequence, unless we count the two instances of possessions in sonnets 18 and 129. Sessions has always suggested the periodical sitting of a court from the old French act or state of sitting or assembly, which ties in with the established legal theme. Sweet meant pleasing to the senses, mind or feelings, or having a pleasant disposition. It's not clear if the Old English origins of the word thought would have been familiar in Shakespeare's day, but if they were, then its meanings of process of thinking, a thought, compassion, and something conceived of in the mind or considered would operate very well in describing the essence of the sonnets and would be in line with a number of established sonnet themes. It makes sense that summon, in the context of the word sessions, meant call, cite, or notify by authority to be at a certain place at a certain time. But its original meaning of call, send for, ask the presence of, combined with its late 16th century meaning of arouse or excite to action, suggests the summoning of spirits. 
Catherine Duncan Jones in the Arden Sonnets suggests that summon up may be a play on the expression summing up, which is highly likely considering the other references to accounting and auditing in this sonnet. Up seems like it might be interesting because although Shakespeare usually writes it this way, VP, there are a few other places where it's written UP. Remembrance meant a memory or recollection, but it also included consideration, reflection, present consciousness of a past event, store of personal experiences available to recollection, capacity to recall the past, memento, keepsake, souvenir, and a commemoration, remembering, or ritual of commemoration, all of which fit smoothly with the overarching themes of the sonnet sequence. Of particular interest is its relationship to the 15th century term remembrancer, a royal official of the national treasury who was tasked with recording and collecting debts due to the crown, which became another way of describing death, who features in the sonnet sequence as Father Time. When discussing Sonnet 23, I mentioned that fierce thing likely referred to the sonnet sequence. The old English origins of the word thing relate to both the legal theme, meeting, assembly, council, or discussion, and the idea of the sonnets being creations and agents of their author in act, deed, event, material object, body, being, or creature. Lack, which was absence, want, shortage or deficiency means the same today as when the sonnets were written, but in Middle English relates to lackless, meaning without blame or fault, which is in line with the legal theme. Dear times waste, as a phrase, evokes dear times, the precious period during which Shakespeare was alive and interacting with the sonnets, as well as Sonnet 7's wastes of time, the desolate eternity, and times as a plural may well be a metaphor for the dear sonnets and the waste of Shakespeare's efforts that they could have proved to be. In this first quatrain, it seems likely that the sessions referred to are those of Shakespeare writing the sonnets and the reader reading the sonnets. For Shakespeare, writing the sonnets is an act of reliving his past trauma. For the reader, the sonnets are sweet, and they themselves are silent even though the reader is expected to sound them out. At the same time, they fight to present a convincing case to the reader on Shakespeare's behalf, and later on in the sequence will wrestle with their loyalty to and love for the bard when they struggle to deal with their own sense of existence, identity, and purpose. It is old woes, Shakespeare's woes, that form the sonnet's primary complaint, and that Shakespeare, the sonnets, and the reader will continue to relive. Then can I drown an eye, unused to flow, for precious friends hid in death's dateless night, and weep a fresh love's long since cancelled woe, and moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Drown here has the obvious implication, and Drown an Eye relates to Sonnet 9's Fear to Wet a Widow's Eye. But I wonder if it's not possible to read this as Drawn, which is what Shakespeare expertly is doing with his words. Unused is the modernized form of the word that appears in the 1609 quarto edition, which is not entirely unreasonable, but in the original text is written un suggesting a decoupling or coming apart. This fits with the separation of the sonnet's initial W into two Vs, and with the theme of the sonnets leaving their author to become their own entity. It bothers me, like most of the modernization choices, that unused to flow has had the surrounding parentheses replaced by commas. As mentioned previously, I suspect there's some relationship between all of the parenthetical texts, and it significantly changes how we read them. One possible interpretation that's prevented by this modernization is that the sonnets are dissociated from their maker, another that the reader cannot continue reading while their eyes are filled with tears, yet another that Shakespeare's eyes, unused to tears, are now drowning in them. Flow meant to flow, stream, issue, become liquid, melt, abound, or overflow. Precious, meaning costly, honorable, or of great worth, relates to the previous lines dear, and in Shakespeare's day was sometimes used ironically to mean worthless. Dateless night meant night without any sense of time, the eternity of darkness in which the sonnets exist between readings. 
Additionally, back in those days, date would have been used in a way that we're familiar with to suggest marking a document with a date. Cancel literally meant cross out with lines or draw lines across so as to deface. In the case of the sonnets, they themselves can be described as long since cancelled woes. Moan in Old English meant lamentation, mourning, weeping, complaining, the expressing of complaints, a complaint, lover's complaint, accusation or charge. These meanings tie in with the legal context, as well as to the attached poem A Lover's Complaint that Shakespeare published along with the sonnet sequence. It's quite possible that Moan the Expense was intended as a visual trick for the reader to see the word money, but even if not, the word expense would connect us to the lending and borrowing theme established in Sonnet 4, and relates this sonnet to the only other two appearances of the word in Sonnets 94 and 129. The eye being drowned could be Shakespeare's as he writes these sonnets. Shakespeare's wife's mourning the loss of her son and possibly her and Shakespeare's subsequent estrangement. The reader's eye as they experience the sonnet's world. And as the sonnets themselves, each one an eye of Shakespeare and a window through which he looks back out at us. The precious friends that are hidden in Death's Dateless Night are the sonnets, friends both to Shakespeare and to the reader. But this may also be a reference to all of the friends and loved ones that Shakespeare and the reader have lost throughout their lives, or all of the readers that the sonnets have seen come and go. Weep a fresh love's long since cancelled woe can be read in two ways. Weep again for love's old sadness, and weep for the old sadness of a fresh love. The former would refer to Shakespeare's grief that is resumed whenever he or the reader reads the sonnet and the latter to the reader's fresh love, the bard, whose reading causes them and the sonnets to weep again for the sonnet's old love. Many a vanished sight refers to the remembered sight of the speaker's lost loves, especially Hamnet and the sonnets, and if each sonnet is an eye, then each reading is a sight that vanishes once complete. Then can I grieve at grievances foregone, and heavily from woe to woe tell o'er, the sad account of four bemoaned moan, which I knew pay as if not paid before. Grieve meant to make worried or depressed, to make angry, enrage, to be physically painful, cause discomfort, as well as cause grief to, disappoint, be a cause of sorrow, and injure, harass, and oppress, as well as be sorry or lament. Grievance meant harm, injury, misfortune, trouble, suffering, agony, sorrow. Foregone in the original text was hyphenated, so while we can read grievances foregone as grievances that have already occurred, we can also read it as grievances before they have departed, and the sonnets are, as has been mentioned before, a long and elaborate list of grievances. In addition to with much weight, heavily meant violently, intensely, sorrowfully, and sluggishly. Tell meant to make known by speech or writing, or announce, and to reveal or disclose. Or, as usual, has been modernized to o'er or over. Every time one encounters o'er in the modernized text, it must be understood that it was written or in the original. Although the modernized reading is usually sensible, the more I encounter it, the less correct it seems. Throughout the sonnet sequence, or, as in metalliferous mineral or rock, generally suggests a precious stone or ink, as uncovered in sonnet 23, and may also imply beginning, origin, or front from the Old English or, and possibly even relates to oral, of or pertaining to the mouth. Tell or, then, could be interpreted as reporting with ink and recording to ink, as well as to the treasure which we've already encountered in the sonnet sequence in sonnets 2, 6, and 20. Account meant story, but ties into the established auditing theme in addition to the legal theme. Pay and paid could be read as to appease, pacify, or satisfy from the Old French. All that being said, 
A thorough reading of the third quatrain involves a little bit of time travel. 1. After writing the sonnets, Shakespeare can grieve both the losses they describe as well as the loss of the sonnets themselves when he sends them off into the future. From woeful sonnet to woeful sonnet, he pours out his sad account in ink, mourning that which has already been mourned and which will be mourned in the future. And with each sonnet he writes and each sonnet he reviews, he pays dearly with the time he has left on earth, in addition to the emotional cost of reopening old wounds. 2. The sonnets, once completed to the point where they can bring their readers to tears, can recount the bard's woes one by one, reliving his tragedy for each reader and each reading. For every reader, the sonnets will tell their tale as if for the first time. 3. The reader, who during the reading grieves not only for Shakespeare and the sonnets, but for their own losses as well. Each reader reads the woeful account back to the silent sonnets as if they're the first to do so. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. It must be noted that in the original quarto text, dear friend is in parentheses. The closing couplet is very interesting, as it very much contrasts with the rest of the sonnet. Depending on which of the three ways we've read it, dear friend will take on a significantly different meaning. The, as usual, refers to any of the three main characters in the story, Shakespeare, the sonnet, or the reader. Dear friend, as it's in parentheses, clearly indicates that whichever the is intended, it's as opposed to the sorrowful subjects the rest of the sonnet discusses. If Shakespeare is speaking to the sonnet, he could be saying that his personal memories and the other sonnets bring tears to his eyes. But when he thinks about this sonnet, or the sonnet sequence as a whole, or even more likely, the reader, his sorrows end and his losses are restored by being remembered by others. If the sonnets have been mourning Shakespeare and his tragedies, then thinking about the reader brings them relief. If the sonnets have been recounting tales of their own struggles since setting forth from the publishers, then thinking of Shakespeare or the reader will make all of their difficult journey through eternity worthwhile. If the reader has suffered and is sad or lonely, then Shakespeare and his sonnets will be a comfort to them, and as long as they read them and reciprocate their love, their own losses will be forgotten. Having said all of these wonderful things, the closing couplet of Sonnet 30 also provides us with some clarification on the final words of Sonnet 28. But day doth daily draw my sorrows longer, and night doth nightly make grief's length seem stronger. During Shakespeare's day, he transforms his sorrows into sonnets and extends the sequence as far as he can. During his endless night, the bard's physical experience of sorrow ends. As long as we continue to read the sonnets, share his grief, and think fondly of his life and his works, Shakespeare will consider himself compensated for his life's losses. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording this podcast, converting these podcast episodes into a book, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. Once again, I need your help to make this happen. Please consider signing up to support this project at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. And keep up to date with the graphic novel progress at sonnetcomics.com, Facebook, Minds.com, Twitter, Instagram, or Reddit. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not, not just another not one in your place? place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? Ever.